Kavira Kaya from Merlwani with us today. We have one and only Stephen Wilson. How are you doing today? Very good, thank you. Very good. You know, home invasion is just a few weeks away, and and I was I've been watching it from past few days, and it's like how do I put it? Like the overall production is 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 so phenomenal. I mean, first of all, it's such a legendary venue, and then you have these fascinating lights, you have the holograms, you have the dance group on stage. I mean, it's shot at a grand epic level, which at least to me sets the bar so high. So is this? If I have to put it that way, the epitome of Stephen Wilson experience, or you still feel that there is way more things to explore. I think one of the things you, when you when you make a concert film mm -hmm. um, and you release it on Blu-ray or DVD like this, you are kind. It's kind of by definition, it is a form of of compromise, right? Because you're trying to you're trying to encapsulate something um, that was designed for a real space mm -hmm. um, in a kind of home television setting. Now, one of the interesting you, you mentioned about the high level of standard, the, the high level of production quality. I think one of the things I was very keen to do with Home Invasion was to not present it as a standard concert film, mm -hmm. but to try and make it more of a cinematic experience. So, a lot of a lot of the sort of live concert films I see, they, they're, they're shot in a very kind of standard generic way right but if you look at home invasion what you'll see is a lot more use of what, what you might call cinematic mm -hmm. techniques such as split screen blurring slow motion right. overlaying of different images so it, it, it to me i hope it feels like it has more of that kind of filmic cinematic quality and part of the reason to do that is to compensate for the fact that you're not there in the venue. You're not right. going to get the same energy right. and, and vibe that you would get, obviously, if you were there in the Royal Albert Hall on the night. So it's kind of an attempt to, to compensate for that by making something that feels a little bit more like it's deliberately designed for, for film and for mm -hmm. cinematic and for film TV experience. So to answer your question, um, I mean, you know what? I, I think I feel t to an extent that Home Invasion... Um, Close is a particular chapter mm -hmm. in my career. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how much further I could take the stage show and the production of the stage show. <laughs> right. Um, at least not at the level that I'm at. You know, if I was, if I suddenly sold a lot more records and I became a much bigger artist with more money to spend, then maybe I could do something then. But I think I've pretty much done. I've taken things to the very limit in terms of what I can do true, true. with making the show that kind of immersive um, multimedia experience based on the fact that I'm, that I'm not playing arenas. You know, I'm playing relatively small theatres and, and clubs. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure where the future will take me. I, you know, I like a challenge. I yeah. like to always feel like I'm evolving and I'm changing. So... The next project will be something completely different again, and, and the live show, I guess, would would have to reflect that too. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the Albert Hall. You played it before. It's one of the legendary places. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was having a chat with Michael Ackerfeld since Opeth do have a Red Rock DVD coming up early next month, and we were talking about these exclusive venues worldwide, I mean, which are very special, and you know, you. Uh, or even Opeth, or even Devon Town. So you guys play this, you know, the underground prop type that, and sell these places out, which is phenomenal. So I would like your perspective on that, if you think that it's more of a shift for people that are looking for meteor music. I think there's something about a, a venue, uh, a very um, uh, appealing venue, appealing for both the artist and the audience, mm -hmm. that has become much more important these days because mm -hmm. um, I think what what the live sort of concert circuit has moved increasingly towards over the last 10 years um, is it being more of a spectacle and more of a multimedia experience and mm -hmm. the use of things like screens and video and quadraphonic sound in my case. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason for that is, of course, that the actual the actual market for um, recorded music has diminished right. significantly. So um, you can't really rely on selling a lot of records now. So you have to really start looking at the live the live performance mm -hmm. as the way to sustain a career. And 
when you start putting a lot more energy into live performance, you start thinking about things like visuals and sound and really raising the bar in, in terms of the production, as Ray right. kind of pointed out, as I've tried to do. And then you start thinking, well, but you want venues that kind of are suitable to put on that kind of spectacle. Um, and a lot of venues in, in, you know, in the world are not suitable. It's always a little bit of a, of a compromise. True, true. Sure, sure. And then, I mean, you know, for example, I take my I take my big holographs and my big screens and my quadraphonic sound all around the world with me. Mm-hmm. But I would say probably one out of every two concerts, I'm not able to put the whole thing in. You know, I'm either I'm not able to use the holographic screen or mm-hmm. I have Based to cut this. this big rear screen down to half the size mm-hmm. or there's nowhere to put the quadraphonic speakers at the back. Mm-hmm. So there's always a sort of something that's kind of stopping you from presenting the full vision if you like right and that's what's beautiful about these venues like you know then you like the royal out hall is i can put on exactly what i you know what i intended and oh. it looks absolutely spectacular and the venue if anything just adds to the kind of aura and the spectacle and there are a few venues like that in the world i'd say olympia in paris and the royal Albert hall the heineken music hall in amsterdam a few of my favorite venues partly because i know that the show I can put the whole show in there and it will look absolutely exactly right. as I intended it to look. Right, right. That, that's true. In fact, I mean, I mean, I have a couple of songs which I, uh, you know, I kept on watching because it's, it feels great. Like, you know, Song of Five, for instance, there is uh, the, the, the light design, the hologram is really impressive. And even during detonation, as you guys are going berserk over the instrumental section, you can see the number of people increasing, wearing masks. You know, it conveys the meaning behind the tracks on stage. And and these aspects play a very important role. I'm just pointing out two songs, but there are, each song has a meaning there, and it's presented in that way. A lot of thoughts go into it. A lot of ideas go into it. How are you going to do it? Because these songs have been there from last, you know, say five years, but you got to present it in a way where new fans are hearing it for the first time, and then the old fans even are surprised at how well this sounds with such great cinematic style on on screen. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think part part of that um, is, of course, being able to collaborate with with fantastic visual artists. And I've been very fortunate over my career to have met and to be able to collaborate with people like Lassa Hoyle, who does the visuals that you talked about, and also the animator Jessica Coates, yes, who cool. produced yeah. the visuals mm-hmm. for things like The Raven and and Sonic right. Horn and yeah. Blue Exactly. These, these, yeah, exactly. These extraordinary uh, animations. So. I mean, I've been very fortunate to be able to work with people that have the talent that I don't. I mean, I can I can kind of explain to them what I see in my head, <laughs> but I don't have any means to actually make that real myself. I don't have any skills in, in terms of creating video or visuals. But I'm very lucky to work with people that do. And a lot of those people have been become very engaged with the whole idea of how can we take the people that come to the show on this extraordinary audio-visual journey. Right. And that's the way I kind of look at it, in a way. I, I look at it very much as telling a story. I mean, the show is quite long. It's about, well, if you, if you include all the bits where I talk, it's about three hours. Without <laughs> sure. talking, it's about two and a half. But still, uh, I talk a lot. Um, but still, even, the, even the, the version on the Blu-ray and the DVD is about two hours. It's over two and a half hours. Two hours, about 29 long minutes. Time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. And that's a long time to expect someone to concentrate. Right. Um, even someone that's a fan of the band, you're asking a lot to ask them to concentrate for two, over two and a half hours. True. So part of that for me is, okay, how can we, how can we keep their attention? How can right. we keep them surprised? Just when they think they've seen, just when they would think, just when they think they've seen everything, you kind of hit them with something new, a new <laughs> kind of right. visual gag. Right. And, that's what it all was about for me, really. So when I sat down with Lasser and Jess, I, I mean, I was kind of planning. Almost, it's almost like choreographing, almost like directing a movie, mm-hmm. trying to keep each scene like a development and a kind of, um, you know, an evolution from the previous scene. Right. And that, that took a lot of planning. I mean, we started planning the live show six months before the first show. Mm-hmm. So it was six months of hard work even before we set foot on the stage to play mm-hmm. the first show. Right. And, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie, it was absolutely exhausting. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was stressed out. I mean, by the time of that first show, I was so stressed out, I was so exhausted, and I, I spent so much money as well. You know, it's a big... And I understand why a lot of bands don't want to do this, because it's very expensive. Absolutely, and I get it. Very time-consuming. 
and it's very stressful. But you know what? When you get it right, and I think... It, it, it feels good. It feels yeah, good, it works, definitely. So when Absolutely. it feels good and when it works right, then it's obviously one of the most rewarding things uh, you know an artist can possibly hope to have, and, and that's certainly the way I feel about it. Yeah. True, true, true. You know, I, I was uh, as I kept on watching the DVD. There's one part where you just come on stage and you say pop music rules. If you don't like it, you're a musical snob, and that was bang on. I mean, it's so awesome to see how the response came when songs like Pariah or even Permanating was played, where people stood up. They were literally dancing or they were literally complimenting how beautiful it sounded and how all the dancers came on stage and performed along with you. I bet that was the moment where possibly, say, 30% of the crowd out there who may not have liked the song absolutely were mesmerized with it. And that's just one example which I feel as an audience watching the DVD. And that's something I'm sure you must have been sick and exhausted with all these negative vibes that have come with this terminating song. But people's mindset is changing when they see it live and i believe that's that's a great sign i think yeah i mean permanating was a very interesting song it, it was the song that i was very uh keen to release because i knew it would upset uh, some of my fans and <laughs> you know part part of part of being an artist of course is confronting the expectations of your audience not simply giving them more of the same and not right. simply giving them more of what they want and also over the years, I've caught, and I'm sure you're aware if you followed my career, I've always resisted tried to resist this idea of, of generic classification. You know, some people, some people, in the early days, I was called space rock, so <laughs> rock, then progressive metal, and then more recently, usually people just call me progressive rock. And I've never called myself any of those things. And so the resistance to that... Um, Part of that, winning that battle, if you like, is being able to slip in things like permanating, so have I, pariah, things which, are, which have nothing to do with that world. Right. But as you say, kind of win the audience over. And it's one of the really, I mean, I, I didn't only see it at the Royal Albert Hall. I saw every single night of the tour when permanating was played. You couldn't help but smile. If you're Absolutely. In the audience, you couldn't help a big grin on your face. Because it's a very joyful song, okay. and it's very catchy, okay. and it's, you know, and one of the things, I mean, my, my speech on the DVD is very short, but I'll, when I was saying earlier about I talk a lot more, more in the show, I have quite a long speech about permanating. Oh, okay. And one of the things I say about, one of the things I say about the song is that I think for a lot of people now that particularly grow up, have grown up listening to rock music, mm -hmm. is that pop has become almost a derogatory term. And that only, but it, but it should not be, because you only have to remind people that the quintessential pop group of all time is the Beatles. Beatles, right? And everyone, everyone likes the Beatles, don't they? And so, right. if you say you don't like pop, then you're almost saying that you, you don't, don't like, like the Beatles, Beatles and right. you don't like ABBA, and you don't like Elton John, and you don't like the Pesh Mode, and you don't. And, you know, and these are bands that most people, well, they like at least one or two songs. True. So, true. therefore, they like pop music. Great pop music is, I think, something that should be championed, and nobody should ever be snobby about great pop. True. And that's kind of my point, I think. Um, and as you say, when, when I play Permanating Live, everyone is on their feet. Everyone Absolutely. Has got a big I can on see that. Face. Yeah. Awesome, man. That's, that's really great. It, it was wonderful seeing you include the pocket tree material. In fact, the last time when we discussed, I mean, you made a very good point where you mentioned that you've come to a certain understanding that there are fans of your past, there are fans of your recent past, and there are also fans of your present. So it, it's important for you to make sure that, you know, everybody just leaves home with a, with a smile on the face once the show is done. And with such a huge catalog of pocket tree, was it sort of difficult for you to pick out some of the songs for this DVD? You know what, it's not as difficult as you might think. I, I think there's two things to say about that. Firstly, I don't have any hits, you know. Yeah. And, and I say that, and I, I mean that in a kind of a positive way, because, it, you know, I don't have, you know, I don't have a purple rain. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a, you know, a comfortably numb. I don't have those kind of songs that everyone coming to the show expect. is going to expect. Mm -hmm. I don't have a rock fan, you know. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's kind of liberating, because it means there aren't any songs, particularly in my catalogue, that I, that I feel like I'm almost obliged right. to play. Right. There aren't songs that are coming to the shows, at least I don't think so. I don't think there are songs that people coming to the shows will ever expect to hear. Mm -hmm. They never know 
quite what they're going to hear at a, at a, at a Stephen Wilson show. And I think that's really, in a way, that's been, it's been frustrating that I haven't had any tickets, you know, but at the same time, it's been liberating, liberating. because it means every time I come to put a new show together, I can pretty much choose the songs that I want to play purely on, you know, for very selfish reasons, purely on a whim. You know, I have written a lot of songs. Um, I don't, I'm not proud of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like all of them. But there are a lot of that I do like. But they're not always the ones that perhaps are the most obvious ones. Like, right. for example, in the show at the moment, and also in, in the Blu-ray DVD, is a song called Creator Has a Master Tape, yeah. which is a, a fairly old song that was originally recorded by Porcupine Tree. But it is one of my songs. And it was a song that Porcupine Tree never played. played. Because the rest mm -hmm. of the band didn't like it. The rest of the band just didn't like that song, so we never played it. And it was a song that I've always liked. And I thought, you know what? This is not the most popular song on the record. It's not the most popular song in my back catalogue. But I think that it, the, my current band could do something really interesting with it. Mm -hmm. And I think it could be a really dynamic live track. And that's exactly the way it turned out. So I think people coming to the show, they're, they're surprised to be hearing that song. Yes. But it's very much a purely personal thing for me. Um, there are other songs like Sleep Together Again. It's not the most popular song on that mm -hmm. particular record. Mm -hmm. But, but it's my favourite, you know. So I'm choosing the songs in a very selfish way. Um, but I like to think that people at least, you know, kind of respect that that is my right. Sure, sure. To, to, you know, to play the songs that I'm most proud of and that I most feel are relevant sure. um, to my current band and my current sound. There are certain songs that perhaps people would like to hear, but to me they don't seem... Um, they don't seem relevant to where I am right now, musically. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing I think that's worth pointing out, is that you have to find songs which kind of fit with the current repertoire. Right. Uh, and that sometimes can be, to do with, that can, can be to do with the lyrics, or it can be to do with just the musical style. And so the show, the To The Bone show, is very much trying to find that balance of balance. material, mm -hmm. where it all feels... It's not like it feels like you're suddenly doing a song that's 20 years older. Right, right. It feels like it could have been written. Feels like it could have been written today, and that's how I want the, the, the show to feel. To be. You know? awesome. That, that's really good to know. You know, To the Bone has been more than uh, a year now, and generally I've seen that you have a lot of songs which are sort of uh, leftovers, and then you end up releasing some kind of a B side or say an EP, like Four and a Half, for example. Is there something that is left over from To the Bone which, say, potentially could release sometime soon? I don't think so. I mean, there are a couple of songs that were that were left over from To The Bone. Um, but I think, to be honest, this time around, you know, what, what I always try and do is what you might call an interim release. Mm -hmm. So, in the, for the last album, the interim release was four and a half. Yeah. The previous album, there was a sort of DVD EP called Drive Home. Right. I think this time around, Home, Home Invasion is, that is the interim release. Okay. Um, I, don't have, I don't have any songs that I'm kind of burning to get out there that were left over from, from To The Bone. I have a lot of new songs which I'm working on for my next project now. Mm -hmm. So I think that Home Invasion will kind of fulfill the role of being the interim you know, kind of in-between albums released this time. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And, and how far have you gone with the new album? Obviously, I know you take your own time unless you're not satisfied with it. Where do we stand at the moment with, say, the new project that you're working on? I've got about four songs I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. So that I'm a long way, I'm a long way from, from being ready to record yet. I, I think, what, you know, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. I, it's very important to me to always feel that every project is an evolution. It's something different. And, so, you know, that might not always be a step up. It could be a step sideways into something different, starting mm -hmm. quickly something a bit different. And I think that's certainly going to be very true of this next record. It's something very different again. Mm -hmm. But I like to think at this stage in my career, everything I do will sound like me, will have right. of my personality behind it, that it's recognizably part of the same body of work, no matter what style I work in. If I work in pop or ambient or metal or progressive or jazz or mm -hmm. singer-songwriter, whatever it is I'm kind of drawing on to create the material, I think ultimately it's just going to sound like part of my my sort of body of work and I'm confident I'm confident enough now in that to be able to try different things with each record mm -hmm. and again it's, it's almost about confronting the expectations of your of your audience because Absolutely. I think there are a lot of people out there that love these 
a lot of people out there would love me to just to keep making a repeat of Hand Cannot Erase or yeah. a repeat of yeah. Bone or, you know, a repeat of the um, Fear of a Blank Planet. And that is not something I've ever been interested in doing, repeating myself. So it's, it's all, sometimes it's all about sort of, you know... Evolution. Um, as I say, but challenging, challenging mm. your, your, your fan base and definitely looking to do that again with this next record. But, but the reason I say that is part of, part of that process is that it becomes more and more difficult to write new material yeah. because there is more and more in the past that you've already done. Yeah. So I'm trying to find sounds and approaches and songwriting, songwriting uh, uh, approaches that I'd not used before. And every album, that becomes a little bit more difficult because mm -hmm. obviously there's a little bit more in your past that you've already covered. So, you know, it's tough. Songwriting for me is the hardest thing about everything I do. I love it. And love I it. It's a bit Definitely the hardest part of the process, yeah. Great, great. You know, the lineup has always been interesting, which I really love about because you love playing with so many people. I mean, right from Gavin to Richard to Guthrie to Marco, and now, you know, you have Adam and you have Craig, who's phenomenal on the DVD. It must be something really interesting for you to see the kind of flavor they bring in, uh, their own aura they bring in on stage with their respective instruments, which you must be really mesmerized that, you know, the change is inevitable and it's good. Yeah, and uh, actually I feel there's a chemistry with this band that I've not had with any of the other lineups I've mm -hmm. had. And, you know, that's not to say I haven't had amazing musicians in the band. Ever since I started uh, as a solo artist, I've, I've been very fortunate to have some incredible uh, musicians come through the band. But I feel there's something very special about the chemistry of this particular band. And I think that's, very, that's worth saying, is that there's something about a band that is not necessarily about how fantastic the musicians are. Right. It's about the way they work together. It's about the chemistry that they create. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had people in my band who, who are arguably, uh, you know, better musicians, but I don't think the chemistry was as good as it was, as mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. in this current band. And I think part of that you can see coming across in the video, in the, in the, in the film, really? is that sense of joy yeah. that we right. have in actually playing together. We're having a lot of fun on stage. And that joy and that kind of passion and that enjoyment, um, I think, does translate itself across to the audience. True, uh, true. Craig, phenomenal drummer, you know, had, had incredibly hard shoes to fill. I mean, following Gavin, Marco, following uh, Marco, and then Chad Wackerman. I mean, uh, th you know, three of the greatest drummers of all time. True, and true. then Craig came along, and he, I think he felt quite daunted. But you know what? He's completely risen to it. And I think he's blown people away, and I think he's firmly put himself now in the same league true, as true. those players. And that's, that's been extraordinary to see, and, and a great kind of, uh, you know, privilege for me to watch him kind of grow into that role and become a real favorite of the fan base. You know? Nice, nice. The concept albums are something which you've, you've, you're very well familiar with. I mean, obviously, let's take, uh, you know, be it Metropolis of Dream Theater or even the latest Astonishing or even what Mike does with Neil Morse with the similitude of, you know, the recent album. Do you sometimes think that maybe I should write a concept album from start to beginning? Obviously, it's a time-consuming activity, but do you ever get that vibe, say, I want to write a next album, which is sort of a conceptual and has a great start and a great ending? I think it's very hard to, to it's very hard to do. Um, one of the things, one of the problems I have with with concept albums is that what happens is the music becomes um, dictated by the narrative. Right. And so, for example, I I'm writing the new record as we discussed. I'm writing the new record now, and I have four songs so far. Now, at some point, I'm going to end up with ten, twelve songs. Yeah. And some of those songs are going to feel. I know from experience that one or two of those songs are going to present themselves as very obvious um, uh, uh, kind of contenders for opening track on the album and closing track on the right, album. Right, right. There's something about, you know, musically, the dynamics of the song, the, uh, whatever it is that feels, oh yeah, that feels like a great opener, or that feels like a great closing Closure. song. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, if you've got a story that's dictating how the music, how the musical flow of the album is. You don't have that freedom, in a way, sure. to sequence the album the way that feels the most musically satisfying. 
And it's a really hard thing to do, really hard thing to do, I think, to get the, the narrative flow and the musical flow perfectly in harmony right. so that it feels like the music is in exactly the right sequence it should be, but it's also telling the story in exactly the right order. Right. Cool. I think that's really tough to do. I think there are very few examples of narrative concept albums that, for me, that completely work. Uh, I would say Quadrophenia by The Who, Tommy by The Who, the Wall, possibly, by Pink Floyd. Right. Um, there aren't many others I can say narrow. There are concept albums, like you could say Dark Side of the Moon is a concept album, but it's not a narrative album. Not a narrative album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's not an album that tells a story from track one to track ten. It has a theme which runs through it. OK, Computer by Radiohead will be another example. Albums that have a kind of thematic unity to them but they're not supposed to be listened to you know they're not designed to be listened to as a narrative and i think that's a really tough thing to pull off in in music um that kind of rock opera or that kind of musical flow and i've not really heard anything i'm not familiar with the albums you mentioned to be honest so i don't know those ones but i've not heard many narrative concept albums that really work really well for me i guess i like more the concept albums that have a kind of theme mm-hmm. that kind of unites all the songs mm-hmm. but that you can still listen to them you know in a different order if you know what i mean right 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 do, 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 absolutely. Stephen, once again, man, you know, always a pleasure having a chat with you. Obviously, you know, DVD is going to be out and fans are already pre-ordered it. I look forward to see you on stage sometime soon. And, and yeah, your, your fans in India are definitely waiting for you to come back. Fantastic. Nice to speak to you too, always. We'll speak again soon. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.